Thank you, Peter. Um, as, as he's already said, I used to work for ARM. Uh, I used to be principal staff engineer there. Uh, and as you know, when you hit the retirement button, then you're a used to be. So I'm a used to be. And you'll have to interpret then what I say in the light of this is not Ian Phillips speaking from ARM anymore. It's Ian Phillips speaking from Ian Phillips. Um, now, it's a long time since I accepted the invitation. And um, I've been working in the application of electronics and microelectronics for rather too long. Um, and so that's why the retirement thing happened. It happened one morning when I looked in the mirror and realized that the, the guy who was looking back at me had got gray hair, which was trying to tell me something. And the sort of thing that he was trying to tell me was that, hey, do you realize it's the 70th anniversary of the transistor this year? Uh, 1947 was actually two years before I was born, which is a little bit alarming. Uh, but it also says that this whole electronics thing um, has happened in more or less one lifetime. Um, because I'm not quite dead yet, so you know, I think we'll add, an, add another couple of years and maybe I will be. But the 1947 saw the invention of the transistor. And like this sort of thing, we have to be a little bit precise about this because it was an invention. The transistor didn't exist before it was invented. It wasn't discovered like um, Africa or something of that nature. It wasn't always there. It was really the, um, the emergent properties of growing knowledge about the properties of materials. And the, <coughs> the concept then, the idea that uh, William Shockley and his, and his friends had was that uh, maybe there's, we're not entirely sure how diodes work and how, the, uh, how electricity is conducted, but they did, they had seen diodes in, exi in existence, and diodes, as, as most of you will know, allow current to flow in one direction but not in the other. And so they speculated that if you uh, were to put a, a thing nearby, let's call it a collector, then some of those carriers which set off across the junction might actually be captured somewhere. And uh, I can't point with anything. Have we got a pointer that I can use? Doesn't matter, I'll point with my long arms. Um, <clears throat> and they speculated that, uh, that this could be the case, and so they set about making the transistor. And of course, that's, that's the transistor, and there's a piece of semiconductor material underneath it, not, and round both sides of that Valentine's heart are conductors. And what they were doing was trying to first of all make a diode and then secondly have another diode nearby that they could use to try and collect it and uh, what they did of course in the top uh, illustration is tr this is what they were trying to achieve the major current flow being modulated by a side um, electrode the base in that particular case and I've used this illustration at the bottom of well it's really like this what they're talking about is varying a resistance under the control of something else and of course they succeeded they made this thing and once they'd made it and they'd take a note of the date uh, 1947 because it just took two years after that for the first commercial transistors to appear now that's pretty damn quick actually most research doesn't make it into commercial production for tens of years. But this one, the transistor, was obviously spotted way back then as having tre tremendous value. The first version of which, of course, uh, by Schottky, was really only a demonstration, not something which was commercially producible. And the real thing then ended up with that sectional diagram over there of a piece of germanium, uh, and st stuck on either side of it and alloyed to it two pieces of indium. And this made the emitter, it made the base, which is this common connection, and it made the collector, which was there to collect all of these carriers which it set across. And it produced the OC71, which was the first commercial version of that transistor. You can see it at the, uh, uh, at the top uh, right of your screen. Now that one was uh, very popular when I started my apprenticeship because you used to be able to scrape the paint off it and use it as a photo detector. And so you were able to do all kinds of things. But you get the general idea that when it was, when it was manufactured and put into a can, you still you have something which behaves like a transistor, but the implementation doesn't look like the uh, original one that Schottky produced. And I want to do that because I want to separate here the difference between architecture and implementation, because this is an implementation, 
of an architecture which is transistors. And if you look at these series of diagrams along the bottom, by 1951, people were already speculating about all kinds of transistors that could be produced. The, uh, the NPN transistor, which was, uh, sorry, the PNP, which is the one they started with, uh, on germanium, uh, immediately somebody said, well, I suppose if we do a, uh, a PNP variety, we can do an NPN variety. Other people were saying, well, actually, we could do a field effect. We don't actually have to uh, encourage the charge with a current. We could actually uh, make a, a, a channel conductive or not by applying a voltage nearby. So the, the concept of a transistor moved very rapidly to, to include implementation details. And yet, that diagram, that illustration of a transistor, you'll still find in the textbooks today, and you'll still find used in descriptions of how circuits work. Anyway, by 1960, we've moved on nine years, but these have become commonplace. So the uh, transistor radio, um, in fact, everybody had them. Sometimes it was a six transistor, sometimes it was a seven, but it was the ubiquitous tranny. Everybody had a tranny. Now, you, the thing about this is, look, six, six or seven transistors, and you can do this thing called radio. Um, now, the thing, the thing about it is we know that these transistors are fairly expensive, so we're going to use them very sensibly. We're going to use them with other components which are fairly simple, but we can make a radio very simply. In point of fact, people have been making radios for quite a surprisingly long time. The uh, BTH crystal set back then, 1925, I mean, before transistors now, how did they do that? Well, they didn't really know much about the the nature of a diode back then. It was a case of prodding a wire around and a crystal and looking to find a naturally occurring diode. They weren't really sure what they were doing at all, but it did enable them to receive radio. Moving on, you've got valve radio. Valves, oh yeah, we've forgotten about those. They predated transistors and were around for quite a reasonable amount of time. In fact, when I started, when I was old enough to, uh, to think about career, then when I started my apprenticeship, I went into uh, an institution, a government institution, using valves. Uh, and so a lot of the early design work I did was with valves. The Bush radio, okay, that's just another example. They took the same circuit and they put it in a bigger box and sold it for some more money. That's marketing, incidentally. Um, and then, of course, you come to this thing over on the top right, you know, the Evoke DAB, Digital Advan uh, Audio Broadcast Radio, 100 million or so transistors in there, probably more than that, actually. Um, how can you possibly think in terms of using so many transistors to do something that fundamentally you can do with one diode? Well, the answer, of course, is that as the value, as the cost of these transistors becomes increasingly small, then you are able to use more and more and more of them to achieve what is essentially the same functionality, uh, but at better or different performance. Now, so I'm going to look at radio for a moment in an architectural context. So this is essentially the architecture of every heterodyne receiver that you can imagine whether it's uh, an old-fashioned one or whether it's a new one, they're still doing the same thing. And you see that actually there is a bunch of equations there which are being done. Uh, they're all straightforward. The bottom one there, look, is just a sine wave generator. In the mixer, you've got a multiplier. It doesn't have to be overly accurate, but it needs to be a multiplier. You've got another at the top there. You've got a bandpass filter. I mean, these are straightforward mathematical functions and you can choose to implement them. So it's an architecture of a radio, and an, an implementation of it in valves will be something like this. It's got each one of those blocks in there. It's not mathematically accurate in the sense that, uh, you know, maybe one radio here and another one from the same production line has a slightly more output than the other one. One is slightly more... Uh, sensitive or slightly uh, less sensitive to noise or interference. One might be slightly noisier than the others. But that's, that's a technical difference which in the, in the main the customer doesn't see. There's actually one, two, three, four, tran uh, four valves there doing that, uh, that circuit which even now was needing six or seven transistors to do. 
The one over here on the right is a uh, rectifier generating the 300 volts that you need for, for valve systems. 300 volts, they're pretty good. They wake you up on the morning with a valve. <coughs> you knew where to put your fingers. So there's your six transistor radio. It's still got the same components in it. And what can we say about this transistor radio, though? We can't say very much about it at all. Um, very typically, that circuit was pulled out of a data sheet for that particular integrated circuit at some stage. You can see you've, there's hardly any components outside it. There's an analog bit over here on the left-hand side, and there's an analog bit over here on the right-hand side. The analog out, because of course our ears are still analog, and the uh, antenna on the, in, uh, on the input side, because ultimately radio is still analog. But inside, in the middle, we haven't got a clue what goes on. <coughs> But we do know that it's got the same architecture inside. So the architecture and the implementation are important to get. Now things moved on a little bit, and this guy, uh, what's his name, Her Herney, can never remember his name. This guy did something architecturally which turned out to be pretty revolutionary. Because at the top there, you can see a cross-section of his transistor. Still a transistor, still doing the same thing, still has a, an emitter and a base and a collector. But the thing that he did, which was pretty clever, was he made it planar. So that means that all the connections are on one side. And the fundamental about this was, he was able to create this thing at the bottom, which was the first integrated circuit. Because all of the connections are on the top, then you can think in terms of connecting them together, things, putting them together. So his transistor was there on the, uh, on the left. The first commercial integrated circuit at all was produced by Robert Noyce, who uh, went on to found Fairchild Semiconductors um, and to, essentially to sell this. But this integrated circuit was one flip-flop. It had four components on it, two, sorry, four transistors, two resistors, and that was an integrated circuit. So the real thing, there it is, and I can remember using that. Um, much less efficient use of those transistors, I hasten to add, but actually more scalable. And that turns out to be an important thing because he could do this design and he could put it on a smaller implementation and it would still work. And that turned out to be kind of fundamental because the whole of semiconductor history, as it's now written, has been dependent on scalability, and it's been dependent on planar process. <coughs> it's more absolute, but you still need an A to D converter and a D to A converter, but the bit in the middle is pure calculation. It's more absolute, absolute but less efficient. You need more transistors to deliver the same functionality. But because it scales, it turns out to be a very, very effective solution. Now, Robert Noyce didn't think about that. He just wanted to make himself a flip-flop. Uh, and other people wanted to use it. But it naturally led on to the state machines and memory, which we're kind of used to seeing around. We know what memory is these days, but don't forget that memory is only useful when it has a context. A memory chip has no significance to anybody unless you have a digital environment in which it can be used. So the other founder of, uh, uh, of Intel about that time was Gordon Moore. So Gordon and uh, uh, came together and they, they, the two of them were making and designing new integrated circuits and new processes. And indeed, when Moore's law was originally coined in 1970, it would have been based on an article that Gordon Moore had written in 1965. And he was, at that time, designing integrated circuits. So the new integrated circuits he was working on had 80 components on, and he was basing his observation on, transistor, uh, on integrated circuits which had preceded them of 30 to 40 transistors. Can you imagine anything quite so small? And he was predicting that by 1975 we might actually have as many as 65,000 transistors or components on an integrated circuit. My goodness, it was hard to believe that that was going to be possible. Of course, we know that it is. Uh, 1965, what did this look like? Well, here's, here's my EDA environment in 1965. That's the sort of uh, circuit that you were drawing. 
uh, and you did draw it like that on a piece of paper, uh, you can see the active components and you don't really notice the wires because that, they're not really doing anything, are they? But they're, they're actually connecting the components together to make this, this circuit function. But you can look at it. You don't need a simulation engine to see that that's a gate. You have to look at it and understand it, but actually, once you get your head around it, that's very simple. So there is uh, 30 to 40 components there if you consider that one integrated circuit was going to hold four two-input NAND gates. So the sort of complexity we were talking about in those days. And though, incidentally, you can still buy TTL logic. You can still buy CMOS logic, which fits in these packages, which still has the same complexity. Just believe me, the die is now diminishingly small. <coughs> so Moore's law, which you have to recognize, is in many respects written in, in retrospect. I mean, various people say various things in time but some of them turn out to be right. So where was that octopus that was uh, predicting the outcome of the football uh, a few years ago? Uh, there's always somebody who turns out to be right, and retrospectively, Gordon Moore turned out to be right in this one. Uh, so back about 80s, they started to notice that this claim that had been made was actually transpiring to be, to be correct. There were some points appearing on the graph. And you may wonder why I've chosen um, a graph which, which was 1999 origins, or well, the reason is it goes back far enough and is not so very far away from, uh, from today that I can't just extrapolate the lines a little bit to, to come to today because it is more or less right. But I'm going to focus on the blue line for the moment, and that's the number of transistors that are on a circuit um, and how they're going up. Now, the thing about that is to notice is, of course, it's a log scale. So the, the transistors are doubling every 12 to 18 months, and it's a little bit like that story about a, um, a slave who wanted one grain of rice on the checkerboard and then doubling that number on the next uh, checkerboard square until he got to the end, of course, he, uh, by the end of which he had more rice, oh, was owed more rice than there was in the kingdom. And so it's, exponents are dangerous things, but this has been following an exponent. So the transistors have been, the number of transistors that you can put on the integrated circuit have been rising at a staggeringly large rate. <coughs> now ARM, which you have had a little bit of an introduction to, and I haven't taken it out of my presentations yet, because it is still significant, because 1991 is not so very far ago. Um, around the time when ARM was founded, we were talking about integrated circuits typically having a million transistors on board. And that sounded a pretty big number, actually. And it was fundamental to the idea that ARM could be used as a component in those integrated circuits because the computer heart of ARM was only 43,000 transistors. So in other words, it wasn't a whole chip full. So you could put it on a chip and you could put other stuff around it. That was the founding idea behind ARM. Now, in the few years that have followed, the 25 years that have followed, the number of transistors that you typically find on a memory chip today is around 30 billion. 30 billion, 30,000 million transistors. It's a big number. And uh, we get that for actually significantly less than we were paying even uh, in 1991 for that piece of silicon, essentially because the volume of silicon which is being shipped worldwide is so large that the price of the, uh, of the dyes have gone down, but also, of course, the price of the transistors has gone down. These are essentially zero-cost uh, electronic devices anymore. Nobody counts transistors. Everybody looks for functionality. <clears throat> But what it also means is that since ARM was founded, we're looking at 20,000 times more transistors on an integrated circuit. We're looking at around 10 times the speed. Now that's 200,000 times more complexity on an integrated circuit today than when ARM was founded with its idea back in 1991. What does it tell you? You don't design anything which is 200,000 times more complex using the same methods as you used in the beginning. So methods, 
are something which has changed hugely. This is not just a case of tools getting faster. It's a case of how do you design something like that? How do you use 20 billion transistors? <coughs> so by 2012, anyway, Moore's law had taken us to 45 nanometer transistors. 45 nanometer. What does that mean in any kind of sense? Let's just say it's pretty small. Um, and NVIDIA's Tegra processor, which was, broadly speaking, the processor scale that you would have had in your first smartphone. So your uh, iPhone, uh, iPhone 1 or whatever it was called, uh, would have had um, a, a processor, broadly speaking, of this nature. And this is what you do with a billion transistors, because this, this was a billion transistor chip. Now, other thing that you, if you've looked at any of uh, integrated circuits under a magnifying glass, under a magnifying glass, under an electron microscope, because when I started, you could actually see the transistors under a magnifying glass. They were 20 thousandths of an inch across, which is uh, five of the, uh, what's that? 20 thousandths, something like uh, about the size of a hair. You could look down on your integrated circuit and you can say that's one of the transistors there, that's another one. You can't see these transistors. They're too small to see. Even when you, when you look in the middle picture with a fairly good level of magnification, you still really can't make out details. Those are just some of the tracks. It's only when you really blitz it and go in with an electron microscope that you see this kind of structure. And in fact, we've taken the oxides off here just so you can see them. So most of what you're looking at there is the interconnect. And the transistors are there, three of them, just three. So what's a billion take away three? It's a lot, isn't it? There's a lot of other transistors there on that, on that circuit. But the thing that strikes you or should strike you is there's a lot of connectivity there. That's just what it takes to connect three of those transistors. So the other factor that's been happening in the, in the same time frame is that we're looking at probably the order of 100 times increased functionality because of the ways that you can connect things together. So we're not just talking of 200,000 times now, we're talking around 20 million times more complex than when ARM started. This kind of observation is not um, terribly popular because, of course, on a day-by-day -day basis, people don't say, my God, this is, this is hugely more complicated, we're going to have to do things differently. On a day-by-day -day basis, people come into work and they tackle the challenge of doing their day job. And their day job has, gets progressively more difficult. And in fact, they usually feel guilty about it because they don't know how to do something. What they should be saying is, this is absolutely amazing. Based on the knowledge that I've got, based on the experience that I've got, I am still able to design something which is getting more complicated so quickly that, uh, that it's hard to imagine. So we don't pat ourselves on the back. We criticize ourselves for going over budget or for being a little bit late, because those are the things which uh, matter in the commercial world. So it's also interesting to note that the atoms which were there when, uh, when Schottky did his first transistor are still the same size as they are today. So we've done all of this vast increase in the number of transistors which are included on the integrated circuit. We've done this vast increase, but on the way we've done it is essentially by getting closer and closer to the atom. Now, when you're dealing with something which is essentially so big that you can see it, then the number of atoms in that are huge. Of course, as you make the transistor smaller and smaller, then the number of atoms in each transistor get fewer. And these diagrams were put together by... Uh, uh, Professor Asen Asenov from Glasgow University who does atomic level modeling of transistors. So he models the actual uh, atoms in every transistor. And it's quite interesting because as the transistors get smaller, his problem gets smaller because he's got fewer atoms to model. And of course, because he's got more and more powerful machinery, which also comes about because the transistors get smaller, then he has more processing power to, to solve the problem, which is also getting easier. So, uh, so it's working out right for him. 
Uh, but it is broadly speaking true. By, by the time you were looking at 130 nanometer transistors, then you were dealing with silicon as a bulk property. But by the time you get to 28 nanometers, then the, the atoms in the transistor are finite. You know, there are hundreds of atoms in the channel. And when you're talking about putting impurities into those atoms to make it into p-type or n-type, you may only be talking about one impurity in a channel. And in fact, in some cases, you have one impurity nearby the transistor, and yet its influence is enough to, to extend to the transistor itself. Now, we've been a little bit fanciful in describing 14 nanometers and, uh, and 7 nanometers, but 14 nanometers is quite interesting because at that point you're ceasing to almost look at transistors as anything other than an atom. So they're, they're getting to the point where the atomic, the, the uncertainty associated with atomic physics is actually starting to be felt in the properties of the uh, circuit which is above it. So there is a growing opinion that 10 nanometers or maybe 7 nanometers will be the smallest ever yieldable node, ever. Now that's a bit worrying. Um, just two or three generations, three to six years before the end of planar scaling. We've been living with it for the last 40 years. All of a sudden, is this going to have a radical change on the way that we think about our technology? Are we going to have to say, oh, it's all stopped, guys. Things are not going to get any smaller. They're not going to get any smarter because we've run out of Moore's Law. You know, people need smaller atoms. Let's invent some smaller atoms. Yeah, they're not forthcoming. Nobody's made any moves in that direction. All they've been doing is exploiting the size of the atoms that are already there. It's actually already seriously difficult. This is not something which is coming soon. This is something which is already here. So there's this thing called Denard scaling which has been a fundamental for a long time, 40 years, 30 years maybe. Uh, this basically said that for every process generation, every shrink that you get of Moore's law, the chip gets smaller, the chip gets faster, the dyes get cheaper because essentially the cost of, uh, of, of a wafer is the size of the wafer. And so if you make the dyes on it smaller, then in, in, inherently they get cheaper. Now Denard scaling has ceased probably for the last eight or ten years. We've not been able to make use of that. The smaller geometry processes, um, ultimately some of the, there was a delay, there was, you get some power improvement, you get some speed improvement, and you get some cost benefit. But increasingly the, mo the, the modern processes at around the 28 nanometer node, they don't give any of that anymore. They cost more, they produce, they take more power, their performance is often worse than the, uh, the earlier generation. And, and, and so Denart scaling has stopped. So the only thing that you're now left with, which you get out of smaller geometry processes, is smaller processes. Now, of course, if you're making something like memory and you want to squeeze more and more and more of it onto a chip, then that's good. But if you want to do something like logic, then actually, mostly, that's not a problem. You want speed, you want efficiency, but you're not that keen, not that worried about it. So already we're seeing then that not all the chips which are in a typical product will be using the latest, smallest process. It's not necessary anymore. So you're starting to see processes get mixed up. Um, <coughs> it's increasingly difficult to make nanoscale devices, um, or features for that matter. Um, the, I'll come to that, come back to that on the next slide, but basically sharply increasing process complexity and cost. If you can't make something to, so small, then it means yield, and yield means cost. So you can't, if, if you've got hundreds of dye on your wafer to start with, but you've only got a yield of half, then you know, it's, it, it's a poor product. You've not got, you've not got a cost benefit. Reducing yield and reliability. Transistors, which have traditionally solid state electronics never wear out, have moved into the realm where they do wear out. The, the hot electron effects and uh, other effects, um, electromigration, for example, uh, creep, um, insulation, 
These transistors, 10 nanometer transistor incidentally, has got a field strength across it. It runs on one volt, but it's got a field strength of 80 million volts per meter. Think about that. What piece of air will support 80 million volts across it? And the answer is none. Air isn't a good enough insulator for uh, use on these small transistors. So it's meant significant changes to the design methodology because you can't rely on all the transistors being there or being reliable. And of course, photolithography. And as I say, I'll come back to that on the next slide. And of course, increasingly, the statistical nature of the atoms is showing through. Uh, it shows through in the electrical characteristics because these are intrinsic variability now caused by the properties, the absolute properties of the atom. And that means that the electrical characteristics are out of control. You can have a transistor here, which is perfectly in spec, and right next door to it, you'll have a transistor which is out of spec. And in the next die, they'll be the other way around. You have no control of these, because it's, the it's the laws of physics that are controlling those. But it, let's just say, if you want to make a chip which is dependent on this, then the designer's task has become increasingly difficult, because he has to handle it. So is this the end of Moore's law? I've already touched on that. I like this one because it's somebody once said to me, it's like painting one inch lines with a four inch paintbrush. Um, this is a, an, a nice graph because it goes back quite a long way. And if you look to the top left, it says 430 nanometer deep blue mercury vapor. For a long time, all the way in fact up to the mid 1990s, that deep blue light was good enough. It was a small enough wavelength to enable you to produce the feature sizes that you were talking about on silicon. There was a bit of a breakthrough around that same time when, uh, fortunately, as we were going to 300 nanometers, 350 nanometers, uh, there was a breakthrough in the illuminators, and this thing called the eczema laser came out with 100 nan 190 nanometer, which allowed us to progress at least for a couple more mode, uh, Moore's Law generations um, before we were stretching the wavelength boundary. But then there's this fellow down here which has been the great promise of the future. The EUV, Extreme Ultraviolet um, uh, Illuminator for the photolithography process. That's very much tomorrow's technology and it's still tomorrow's technology. But if it was to enable 16 nanometer uh, illumination, then we would be okay. All of these processes would have got a lot easier. But as it is, from about 2000, we've had to be using sub-wavelength uh, photolithography. And that's involved quite a lot of tricks. Um, sub-wavelength immersion lithography. You know, light has a shorter wavelength in liquid than it does in air. So you put a bit of liquid between the, uh, the wafer and the, uh, and the optics. That enables a little bit of an improvement. Dual tone resists. So you're using resists which have actually got different um, frequency characteristics. And you use two sets of masks to produce the features, uh, which, of course, the masks are all getting hugely expensive at this point because not only have they got lots and lots and lots of features on them, but you now need to have two of them. Um, and they're going to be used in combination to do the exposure, which means that you've got to be able to do immensely detailed alignment between these two masks to produce the same features. Uh, I think the, the scale of that alignment was on another slide I didn't use, but it's equivalent to aligning two pictures of the UK on top of one another to the dimensions of a typical house brick. So it's pretty tight. Um, and they're doing that. And of course, it's taking a lot of costs to do it. But they're being very, very clever and using 193 nanometer light are actually making 30 nanometer features. Now, that, need, that requires, there's, nothing, there's no fundamental reason why you, ca why you can't expose features smaller than the wavelength of the light that's being used but it does get very difficult. You do need to effectively have very large aperture lenses. And uh, this is lenses which are used with light that you can't see. So you can't, you can't use uh, manual um, polishing to help to produce these things. And a lens, a typical lens today, is about the size of the average dustbin. So it's, uh, it's not something which is like uh, you find a, a lens on your camera. So... 
just for some other scales, just so we know where we are, a silicon atom is 0.2 of a nanometer. We're at 22 nanometers. And in fact, the latest process is being prototyped right now, 10 nanometers. But one of the things that you can observe, um, somehow you get the idea that these process steps have been made individually. You know, I, here I am, I've got a fab, all I need to do is to keep making this thing smaller. But the reality of it is, it's a team activity, and it's a global team activity. The people who are producing this uh, extreme UV stepper are IMEC in Belgium, ASML, leading the world. They, this, is, this processor is around $100 million when, they, when they're going to sell it. They haven't quite got it there yet, and one of the biggest problems they have is the, uh, let's say, the light bulb is the way they refer to it. And they're, um, they're evaporating pure tin with something like 100 megawatts of input power to make a light which is of that nanometer, 13 nanometer, bright enough to expose a wafer in a time which is uh, compatible with manufacturing process. Now, the other thing that's been happening again to get around the, the problems of dimensions is the silicon itself has moved away from being planar. The field strength of the gates, this, this 80 million um, volts per meter that I was talking about, means that they also have to do uh, drain and source engineering because otherwise they can't stand the voltage. But the, the move here is towards what's called 2.5D. Moving the transistors away from planar up into vertical structures gives you better control, but it also makes increased process complexity. So it's, um, it's interesting to see that the first integrated circuits had four elements in them. The current uh, integrated circuits used around 14 elements in them. So I'm talking about elements from the periodic table here. So these are the materials that are being used. We've also moved quite significantly away from the uh, one layer of metal, or indeed in the very first integrated circuits, no layers of metal, to 10. So this is another way of increasing your, uh, your logic density, is to get rid of the spaces in between the transistors, but that means putting more and more layers on top. It's not hard to believe, because people are working on it, that the, the short-term objective as a way of trying to keep up this increasing density is to move from what's called 2.5D to 3D. So a proper three-dimensional solid block of transistors and interconnect. Um, there's so many questions which remain to, be, to making that thing work. And then, of course, we mustn't forget the simulation. We understand an awful lot more about physics now. We understand a lot more about the processes that we're going to be creating and the characteristics of them, which means that, again, Asan Asanov is able to um, predict the behavior of processes which have yet to be created. And the process guys didn't believe him when he first started talking to them about 10 years ago. Now they do. And uh, so he's actually become very key to their um, development of new processes. So we, these are exercises really of teamwork. That's what's, what's moved Moore's Law forward. Not any one of them, but the progressive improvement of all of them. Not one team working on this thing, but teams all over the world working on this thing to the benefit of the businesses that are going to exploit it. Back in 1947, 47, again two years before I was born, so this is about the same time as uh, Schott inventing his transistor. This is what a computer looked like. Before this, it looked like a lot of ladies sat in a room working out things uh, longhand with a pen and paper, because that's where the computer originated. But this is the first general purpose stored program computer, 1947, Manchester University. And there's no doubt about it, it was driving the technology. So when the transistor came in, this is the thing that they were, they were targeting at replacing, making it more powerful making it more available, uh, making it more reliable, because it was breakdown every day. Um, it was digital electronics, base two, 
Um, it was a general, what else? It doesn't say anything else that doesn't need to be said. But it is the basis of the computer that you know today. Now the question really is, in today's environment, does this high performance computing still provide the challenge which is driving technology forward? HPC machines are undoubtedly the highest performance thing that the world wants to see. But sh so surely they must be the moonshot which is driving the technology forward. Well, the answer is no, they're not. The thing that's driving technology forward today is this lot. It's the consumer who buys functionality, not technology. Previously, it was people who were buying technology. These were professionals. But now, the, processor, the processes are determined by the consumer. And this is what's been happening. Back in the 70s, the mainframe really was the, uh, the leading kid on the block. There wasn't desktops and minis and personal. But as the years have gone by, these new markets have appeared. And they had very much larger volumes than the others, than the predecessors. And we're left with what's called the Internet of Things these days, the IoT, which is going to move forward the volumes yet again. But it's also going to mean that the technologies are determined by the consumer's requirement for them, not by the professional requirement for them. And it means then that the professional market, which is still there, the mainframes are still there, the high performance machines are still there, but they've now got to use commercial technologies to implement them. And if you go out and you look in the, in the press recently, you'll find that the ARM processor, which don't forget was originally designed as the processing engine for number one smartphone, a consumer product, is going to be used for the next latest, highest generation, leading performance in the world, high performance computers. That's the, the, the influence of commercial technology over professional electronics. So I'll come back to this one because the red line I've not been talking about so far, but the red line was productivity. Uh, back in 1991, it took about 100 person years to design an integrated circuit. But the problem with exponents, again, is that gap is an exponent. And so if you, if you just ran it forward a couple of years, you can see that uh, 1,800 and 8,000 odd person years is unsustainable. People couldn't put that much effort into designing these integrated circuits. And of course, things were getting worse because as you designed an ever more complex thing, it became ever more complex to check that it did what you wanted it to do. And so the prediction was that the, back in 1991 when, when this, oh sorry, 1999 when this chart was produced, that this verification gap was going to be a really, really serious problem. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen because, again, a thing that the industry was doing that it didn't notice was actually single designers. My first chip I designed on my own. Single designers have become small teams, have become local teams, have become global teams. Global teams are supported by the existence of the Internet. They simply wouldn't have been possible before. It also meant that clean sheet design, which used to be where it was all at a few years ago, had become dominated by reuse to the point where today it's simply not possible to make the electronic systems that we're used to having all around us without huge amounts of reuse um, and so as a function as a part of the design cycle it tends to get overlooked people are interested in designing their own particular circuit but reuse is the thing which makes products and we've got to remember that products are the thing that ultimately puts money back down this chain and funds all of our activities so how do you set about using a, the odd billion transistor? Well, memory is good. Memory is a simple cell, six transistors, repeated as often as you've got space to put it on silicon. Excellent. But as we've already said, unless you've got some context, a digital environment which means or needs a lot of memory, then memory is useless. A, a, um, a micro SD card is useless on its own. It's only when you plug it into a digital camera that it gains some sort of context. So it needs the context, and the context comes from things like function blocks. Now these could be static function blocks, or they could be programmable function blocks, and the CPUs, GPUs, 
accelerators, encryption engines, and so on, all give memory a context. But of course, they're there for something else because functionality is what people ultimately buy. <coughs> but they're large blocks on their own right, and they facilitate the use of memory. So processors are actually pretty good. And uh, of course, that's what ARM did. Back in 1991, that was the processor. It wasn't actually that complicated. Um, I don't expect you to uh, answer questions on this later, but that's actually a simple 16-bit processor. And the concept that ARM had was a business concept. It wasn't even a technical challenge. It was just to treat that like some sort of Lego brick to enable the production of an integrated circuit um, using getting the processor part and the interface to the memory and the, and the design of the external system to move it into a software world to allow people to put what other functions they wanted onto the silicon to make a product that they wanted to, to make. And the product is the important thing. But the design of productivity then had become the methodology driver. The only way to realize these possibilities in a reasonable time with a reasonable team is huge amounts of reuse. You can see it, hardware, software, in company, external company. I mean, people didn't used to communicate between each other as far as their products are designed, they did them inside. Reuse improves quality, but it also increases complexity. And systems always have errors. The question is whether they affect you or not. But now it does mean that nobody ever does truly clean, clean sheet design. Nobody starts off with a big sheet of paper on which nothing has been done. They always start from what, what has gone before. It might have gone before in their, in their company, it might have gone before in the industry outside. But the thing about it is, they would never get it to production if they didn't depend on using that. And it becomes important then that your product, if it's going to incorporate reuse from somebody else, that, that the provider of that reuse has got to has got to be able to support an evolutionary product because those customers, the, those system providers can't afford to start again. They've got to continue from where they had already achieved. So Apple's iPhone N is always based on Apple's N minus, N minus one. <coughs> so here we go. Um, so the simple concept of ARM, of a little block that went into a chip, has evolved quite significantly. We're now talking about thousands of partners. You're talking about um, design environments, uh, which include security. What have we got? Um, logic families, DSP, CPUs, uh, the methodology to connect things together, and all of the chips inside such a system. And typically in a smartphone, you're talking around 20 chips. A lot of them are going to be making use of ARM technology, which brings me back to, to Pete's question. How many processors, how many ARM processors are in your smartphone? The answer is it's probably about 20. 20, 20 processors in your phone. You tend to think of it as perhaps having one chip in there and one processor. It's not like that. <clears throat> and so ARM to support this has a range of processors from simple ones at 50,000 transistors to more complex ones at around 50 million transistors. Different families, there is the, the digital signal processing, specializing uh, processes, and then you've got the general control processes. And uh, they, the aim of this, of course, is to, to provide a different range of processes and their design environments to target different application sweet spots. It amounts to 24 processes in the current family. That's a lot to maintain, but it also means a design methodology which allows people to design their systems. So here is a schematic diagram of how you might produce such a system, but it's provided to the customer not only as a circuit diagram, but as a, a, a model implementation that they can take to their hardware design environment, but also as a model implementation which they can take to their software design environment. So they can start writing software on this and it will run at real time before they've got um, a piece of hardware to, to, to exercise it on. Because it's all important in terms of making something work, making it work first time, and making the quality high enough. 
That means tools, libraries and partners and interconnecting all of that to make it into something. It has been said uh, that ARM's processor must be very vulnerable, vulnerable because there is lots of processors out there including uh, the V5 processor which is an open source RISP processor. The problem is it doesn't have all of this environment. This is the 90% of the ARM iceberg, the tip of which is that CPU. The people in particular are very keen to see that there is a process roadmap and that the, the technology that they've already invested in can be moved forward to their next generation product and their generation after that and the generation after that. And so Risk Five really doesn't have that environment, it doesn't have that track record, and they can't afford to take on something which is that unknown. How successful was that? Well, I don't suppose many people realize this is 2014 figures. I can't tell you what the latest figures are. Uh, it'll become apparent why, uh, why in a little while. But Arm, um, back in 2014, Arm um, shipped its IP in 12 billion products, 12 billion integrated circuits. That's 12 billion. The population of the world is only 7 billion. So that's two for everybody in the whole world. Uh, total cumulative ship to date, 2014, 60 billion. It's closer to 100 billion today. Uh, it's a virtual business. We have no factory. We don't make any chips. We sell the knowledge to enable people to make chips, to enable them to be productive. They, be, they make the products, and we just sit there and, and enjoy the, uh, the, the, the benefits of that. It's a strange business, but it's a genuine business. Governments find us very difficult, find ARM very difficult to understand, because they presume that from time to time, and they come along and ask, at what point are you going to get your own factory? The answer is never. Arm is not a company that makes, um, makes end products. It's a company which is feeding knowledge and know-how into the life cycle of these complex systems, which are all around you. In fact, the most valuable thing that's happened in recent years to Arm is that it was acquired last year. £24 billion. Pounds. Now, nobody buys a company for 24 billion pounds unless they think it's worth something. So whereas the government may not really understand how a virtual business can make money in, a life, in the life cycle of complex systems, somebody out there was prepared to put 24 billion pounds on the table to show that it was right. So cutting along quite nicely now, design is about delivering a commercial opportunity. I touched on this a little earlier. Designers are not there for aesthetic purposes. They're not there to produce their own, to, to pursue their own goals. They're there to deliver functionality, economical functionality, reproducible functionality, innovative functionality. The product has got to be competitive against the, uh, the alternatives which are being offered by other, peop other people. And they're doing it by predicting the future. The wonderful thing that you physicists have done, by tying down an, incre an ever-increasing understanding of the properties of materials and matter, we've been able to predict a fairly high degree of certainty about what we can do before we do it. We've been able to predict that we're going to do it, broadly speaking what the time is, how much it's going to cost when it moves into manufacturing, and what the quality will be. Thank you, physicists. This is fantastic stuff. We would not have been able to do it without you. Yet, the thing that we get slated for, of course, is missing that certainty, missing the timescale, missing the development. I, I don't know about you, but if you ever go into a, uh, uh, a tent in a fair and sit in front of a crystal ball gazer, you don't really believe what they're going to say. Somehow, we're expected to predict the future and deliver it. <clears throat> the other thing is they base that prediction on the use of available technology. So it's got to be available. It's no use saying this is a wonderful thing just around the corner, like graphene. It's there, and it might very well be useful for something somewhere along the line, but it isn't useful in, in uh, products now. 
Products ha have to use available technology, otherwise it's just a big risk. The only businesses that use big risk technologies are businesses whose back is against the wall, frankly. Anybody who's got any kind of sense doesn't do it. <clears throat> so, the technology is inside an iconic product. It says on the back that it's designed in, by Apple in California and it's assembled in China. As far as governments are concerned, that sums the whole thing up. As far as most people in the street is concerned, that sums the whole thing up. The design is the clever bit, and for that you get a knighthood. Um, and the, uh, the, the bits inside, who knows, it's pure black magic. But let's look, have a look inside. We know... The intelle inside intellectually, we know that there's a design at many stages. Let's take this case apart. Look at that motor for a start. That's the vibration motor. It's so small, it can't be made or assembled by hand. It has to use robotic assembly. It's designed beautifully. You know, it's a, a really nice piece of thing, but nobody gives credit for that. It's just a motor. We design motors. We know what motors are about. The camera. A little module, 8x8x5 eight by eight by millimetres. It's a, sta it's a still camera and it's a video camera. You know, and it's unappreciated. It's just got a camera. The, the phone's got a camera in it. We'll pull things apart a little bit more. Here's the motherboard. Take the lid off the motherboard. That's what one side of it looks like. Look at all the different technology. Non-volatile MOS, BI-C MOS, MEMS, uh, MEMS which are micro-mechanical uh, micro machines. Uh, analog CMOS, saw surface acoustic waves, and of course lots of invisible stuff, the operating system, the drivers, the stacks. There's a lot of components in here, a lot of, a lot of technologies. That's the other side of the board. Oh, didn't mention that. How do you assemble a board with sticking things on both sides of it so one side the things don't drop off the other side as you solder them on onto the top? I don't know. It's somebody's technology though. Somebody's been working on that. Let's go inside the A4 chip because, I mean, this is where it gets exciting. This is the core of it. Look at the package to start with. We've not even got to the chip yet. Somebody's been working on a technology here. This is a cross-section of the package. You can see the gray line across the middle is a section through the processor chip. Then you've got two memory die above it inside that package, which is still just two millimeters thick. A lot of technology here. And the chips, we'll get to it eventually. But there's memory chips, and there is um, um, analog chips associated with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And of course there's the digital chip, which is perhaps the one that we feel most comfortable with because that's where all the PR is. Nevertheless, we've touched on the difficulty of doing that. And all of those virtual components. The glass technology, you know, the uh, buffalo glass, is it, that they call it, which is scratch-resistant. Scratch the analog and digital design. You know, RF is still difficult. Um, the embedded software, signal processing. The list is all, re all there. But the red one is one that I think is important. We can look at all of those things because we can see them. But if you look at the manufacturing, that's outside the product and yet is part of the product. So when people are doing design today, they're also not just designing the product, they're designing the way that it can be manufactured. <clears throat> the bill of materials, helpfully, only describes all of the individual physical components. It doesn't describe the virtual components, and it's not until we have the virtual components recognized that they will cease to be out of sight. And out of sight, of course, means out of mind. So the market's insatiable appetite for new, better, cheaper. You know, it's, it's you guys when you go home, it's your kids, um, it's your other life when you, you stop focusing on the technology and the science in front of you and you start to look at the things that you can buy at PC World. Uh, and you think, ooh, that's, I like that. Or, ooh, look at that big telly. I do like that. You know, these, this is the things which are driving all of this. And you, you somehow expect that if you go back in a year or two's time, when that TV is, has, has lost its gloss a little bit, there is going to be even bigger and glossier TVs capable of doing something else. That drive is the thing which is driving the commercial imperative and that drive is the thing which is putting money back into the supply chain to make all of this happen. The market, however, 
doesn't mandate that we do this with a smaller process. The market only just says, I want better, faster, cheaper. And, you know, you are the market. The fact that you are going to use a process to deliver it, a technology to deliver it, or multiple te technologies to deliver it, is an aside. The thing is, it's got to be the appropriate selection. So we know that since 100 nanometers, silicon shrinks have slowed right down. Processes have got more intricate and more expensive. And yet, that new, better, cheaper imperative has continued as normal. So we are not mostly aware of the fact that Moore's law, law has show, slowed down. And the reason for that is that people aren't focusing on the technology anymore. They're focusing on functionality. People are buying functions in the box. Your phone is smarter than it used to be. You don't mind which technologies have delivered that. <clears throat> so system performance has become the, the dominant factor. So that despite the fact that Moore's law has slowed down, the increase in functionality in the box has continued. And that's important because it means that Moore's law is not about transistors. Moore's law is about functionality. It's just that for so much of the time where we've been messing around with microelectronics, it has been about transistors. But now it's doing a transition. It's about functionality. And that doubling shows absolutely no sign of slowing down whatsoever. So, my last slide. Conclusions. Over the last trans 70 years, the trans transistor has transformed our lives. It wasn't there before, and now we take it so much for granted. We've become used to technology advancing at an expo exponential pace to continually improve all aspects of society and individual needs. Think about what electronics is doing in society right now for you, keeping your car going, your bookings for your trains, planes, your medical systems are all dependent on this technology. And, they do, and they, we want to see it, as humans, we want to see it continue to advance. The transistor approaches atomic sizes. So we are approaching a nadir when uh, the end of Moore's law is being predicted. The people are out there telling you it's going to die. And those are usually the people who have the largest investment in silicon, not systems. But whilst the capacity for silicon to deliver is already reducing, products are still maintaining that, and they're doing it by designers essentially increasing the scope of technologies and the scope of what it means to be a designer. So the transistor isn't dead. It's getting more complex. It's getting more difficult. It will be part of the team of activities which is going to continue to deliver that increased functionality, but it won't be the center of the universe anymore. It's the system that's the center of the universe now. Just like the sun was put correctly in the center of the universe, uh, it's now appropriate to put the system right there. S uh, silicon technology is important, but it's not the only game. So, it's arguably always been about system functionality, doubling every 18 to 24 months, and there is no sign whatsoever of that slowing down in the future. Uh, at which point I will end. Thank you very much for listening and good luck with the next 50 years for those of you who are going to be around. Thank you. I, I understand I will take questions.